Welcome back, I'm Matt Chemist, and today we have five important papers in organic synthesis for the month of September. But before we get started, I have to say, Tomer, you have a really special girlfriend. Sarah wanted me to wish you a happy birthday. So let's get started. The first paper is the oxidative cleavage of alkenes from Danielle Leonori's group. Last month we had another oxidative cleavage paper using nitroarenes, but the paper from the Leonori lab was still in review, and so now it's published. Here we go. Some of the highlights include the oxidative cleavage of styrenes as well as aliphatic alkenes. In the previous method reported last month using 4-cyanonitrobenzene, the types of alkenes that were tolerated were somewhat more limited, or if other alkenes were used, the yields were lower. Although from the Leonori lab, we have a method that's more amenable to the different functional groups and contexts that you might have an alkene in. Additionally, they show that a suite of nitroarenes can be used, and they employ some clever tricks while they're going along the way. So to give you an intro, first this alkene is unable to do a cycloaddition to a nitro group, so they need to photo excite it because thermally this addition isn't able to occur. And so this excited state, once it occurs, goes through the formation of this diuretical species, which forms a new diuretical species, which can then recombine to form this five-membered ring. This is then able to undergo a cleavage to afford two carbonyl compounds. Depending on whether this is a di, tri, or tetra-substituted alkene, you'll get different types of products. And so the mechanism of this reaction was explored a couple different ways. There's two different paths that it could go through. The first is through the formation of an aldehyde as well as this carbonyl imine, which could then be hydrolyzed by water to afford a hydroxyl amine as well as the corresponding carbonyl. Alternatively, this could undergo another process affording both carbonyls as well as a nitrine. Although the nitrine that forms here wasn't actually seen in any of their experiments, so some mechanistic investigation that they did is shown here. They form this adduct to this very sterically hindered alkene, which is now a five-membered ring. When the adduct was treated with acetonitrile water, they get two equivalents of the corresponding ketone as well as the hydroxylamine. Although when they did this in the absence of water, it underwent a cycloaddition with the acetonitrile, which is something Figueroa might do, giving this interesting adduct shown here, as well as one equivalent of the ketone. And so another really clever trick that they employed in this work was the removal of this hydroxylamine. So an issue that they were having during their purification is that this hydroxylamine kept condensing with their aldehydes or ketones. And so to remove this and to just totally take it out of the equation, they had a couple different workup procedures. One of them was to use potassium biphosphate in the presence of urea. This converted it to the corresponding species K shown here. Alternatively, they were able to react with malleamid, forming this adduct shown here. Both of these compounds just took the hydroxylamine out of the system and then it was easier for them to do their purification. Now in terms of the chemistry itself, while all the alkenes were able to be treated with for trifluoromethyl nitrobenzene, they found that when they tuned the reagent, they obtained improved yields. You could just use N1, which is for trifluoromethyl nitrobenzene, although if you screen a suite of these, you might have better outcomes. In some instances, they would use hexafluoroisopropanol. This was just to help polarize the excited nitro species so that less CH abstraction would occur. And as shown here, you can see a lot of different aliphatic alkenes were all well tolerated and they have a massive scope in their paper that I encourage you to go check out. Now, they also examine the selectivity between two different types of alkenes, as well as the selectivity between an alkene and an alkyne. In the case of the alkyne and alkene, they only saw the alkene getting cleaved while the alkyne was not touched. This is quite impressive. Additionally, they found that depending on the different nitroarene that was used, they got different selectivity across different competition experiments between the two different alkenes that were present. And so in their case here, N8 is just nitrobenzene, and that worked the best in terms of selectivity between the two different types of alkenes. So the second paper for today is from Sarah Reisman's lab. The lead author on this paper, Jeff, is actually an active member of the Discord, which was nice. I saw this paper when it was a preprint, and I'm excited to see that it's finally published. And so the highlights of this paper include a really clever synthesis of several matrine natural products from readily available starting materials. They literally just use this diacyl chloride and pyridine as their starting materials, and they elaborate one natural product into several other natural products. These are some examples of the different matrine alkaloids, and the strategy that they employ is the use of pyridine with this diacyl chloride, forming this adduct shown here, which is quite an impressive transformation as several carbon-carbon bonds are formed. Additionally, they did this with an analog with a methyl group, and they were also able to form an enantiopure form of compound 16. So the proposed mechanism of this is as shown. First, the pyridine is able to get acylated by both acyl chlorides to equivalents of pyridine react. Then this enolate-like species forms, which is then able to attack the amenium of the pyridine, which then forms a new carbon-carbon bond. Through the movement of some electrons, we have another six-membered ring formed shown here, although there's an off-cycle intermediate that they detected by proton NMR where this carbonyl is able to get reattacked by the chloride, displacing pyridine as a leaving group. So this is in equilibrium. I think this is quite an interesting intermediate, and I'm surprised that it's stable. Now, once intermediate 2A is formed, through hydride shift we form 12, and that's how they get this key intermediate for a lot of their work. Once they have this compound 12, 
they were able to fully reduce it to this scaffold 11, first through the hydrogenation of all of the double bonds, followed by a lithium aluminum hydride reduction to reduce the lactams to amines. Then they were able to use this really cool chemistry that I wasn't familiar with, where the nitrogen is able to coordinate BF3. They found that the lone pair of the nitrogen connected to carbon 15 was actually more available while the other one was pointed more to the inside of the system. And so the BF3 mainly coordinated to uh, nitrogen 2, which is nitrogen 2 shown there. And so once they formed that complex, they were able to use this chemistry using t buley as well as potassium terpetoxide in the presence of t meta that lithiated position 15 with 10 to 1 selectivity over this other carbon. And then they were able to trap that lithiated species with various different electrophiles. Initially, they tried screening a lot of different enzymatic conditions to do oxidation on carbon 15, but they weren't successful. So what they ended up settling for was trapping that lithiated species with methyl benzoate, affording a ketone that upon treatment with oxygen afforded this lactam, which is isomatrine. So isomatrine is one of the natural products that they wanted to synthesize. Initially, when they tried to make this, they had made the N-oxide at nitrogen 2. As I'd said before, you can see nitrogen 1's lone pair is pointing into the middle of the system, while nitrogen 2's lone pair is more available. Unfortunately, they weren't able to do too much useful stuff with this N-oxide. When they tried to treat it with acetic anhydride and eliminate it, they got elimination at the undesired position. And so they needed to use this lithiation strategy, and they trapped it with various electrophiles. While they were able to use other processes to afford isomatrine 1, such as the use of this nitrile, they ended up settling for the ketone route because the yield was better and they could do it all in one pot. So they have some other cool work in this paper, and I'd encourage you to check out the rest of their paper for some other interesting details, as well as some mechanistic studies. So the third paper for today is the nitrogen insertion into indoles from Bill Morandi's group. This is another paper that I saw the preprint of, and I was also excited to see this one finally published. And so some of the highlights of this paper include the insertion of a nitrine into indoles affording quinazolines. These are really useful products in medicinal chemistry, and this is a really cool approach. So basically what they have to do is they have to protect the nitrogen, otherwise the nitrine would attack at the end of indole. Once they form that aziridine species, it's able to rearrange, affording a quinazoline. And so they found that this chemistry tolerated a wide range of functional groups and substitution patterns, although they did struggle a little bit with nitriles. Essentially, the mechanism is as follows. The nitrine is able to react with the double bond of indole. This is then able to undergo a rearrangement through the elimination of the silane protecting group and through the extrusion of iodobenzene, affording their quinazoline product. Now, if they had blocked that position somewhat, they could get a different insertion forming a six-membered ring where the nitrogen is a piperazine. And so they did some studies to see why that formed, and I'd encourage you to check out their paper to read more about that. When they did this with a seven-membered ring, it was too strained, and they ended up having it trapped by methanol. The scope of this paper is pretty decent. Here you can see several examples where they have this ketal, this amide, this alkyne, a TBS-protected alcohol, sulfones, as well as derivatives of melatonin, derivatives of tryptophan, and several other interesting scaffolds that it's definitely impressive to see. So this is really cool chemistry, and I'd love to see this getting used in some medchem discovery campaigns moving forward. So the fourth paper for today is the detection of short-lived radicals. I don't have too, too much to say about this one other than it's a new method for radical trapping that everybody should be aware of, especially in the synthetic community. This work was done by Andrew Rickard and Victor Chechik's group. The highlights of this paper include a new method to trap short-lived radicals. So sometimes radicals have a very short half-life. You want to trap them as quickly as possible. Maybe tempo won't do the job. So tempo is one of the go-to methods of doing that. So they give us some alternatives in this paper. And this utilizes something called SH2 prime. It's kind of like SN2 prime where you have a nucleophile adding into an allyl bromide and then bromide is the leaving group. Although in this case, a radical adds in and tempo leaves as the leaving group. They produce a couple new compounds that can be used for this purpose. Additionally, if they use additives such as styrene, you can get other adducts that form and then maybe you can see them by ESI to confirm whether or not you actually have the radical you think you do. And so the three different methods shown here are the traditional method where you're trapping your radical with tempo, for instance, forming this cross-coupled adduct that you can see by ESI usually. Additionally, there's spin trap radicals where you have a stable radical formed as the product. Or finally, you have the new protocol that they mentioned here where the radical can add in through an SH2 reaction, sending off tempo as a leaving group. This adduct that's formed can usually be detected by mass spec. So what they did is they prepared two different reagents, chant and dead ant. Most of the stuff that they talk about in their paper is with chant, but they do have some examples with dead ant. The advantage of dead ant is it has a dimethyl amino group that can ionize more easily by ESI. Although chant still does have an amide group and that might still ionize easily. And so one example here is they take benzyl mercaptan in the presence of photoredox conditions. They generate a thiobenzyl radical. This thiobenzyl radical is able to get trapped directly through their SH2 trap. Alternatively, it could react with styrene, producing a carbon-centered radical, which could also react with their radical trap, forming another adduct, 
Finally, they could have this radical trapped by the tempo that was formed. And so there's several different options for trapping the radical as it forms. This way, you should get a hit if your radical is present nonetheless. If you needed to tune this a little bit, you could also tune this strategy and make another thing that would be amenable for your applications. So a new strategy for radical trapping, definitely useful. If you want to see some more examples from their paper, they do some O's analysis and they trap some other interesting radicals. I'd encourage you to go and read the full paper. Now, the fifth paper for today is decarboxylative aerylation. This is from Phil Barron's group. There's a lot of authors on this paper. And the highlights of this paper include the use of silver in conjunction with nickel catalysis for electrocatalytic decarboxylation. And they demonstrate that this works better than some of the contemporary methodologies. And it utilizes simple reagents and it has valuable product. It's air stable, water stable, and they even use lower purity solvents to demonstrate that this is something people could actually use. And so some of the highlights of the scope are that they were able to use aryl iodides, bromides, and chlorides. They will usually compare them in most cases. And they combine this with redox active esters in the presence of their electrocatalytic conditions. And they're able to undergo decarboxylative cross-coupling to afford their sp3, sp2 coupled products. Some examples of their scope are shown here, but they have a lot of examples in their paper. And I'd encourage you to go and read the full thing to really convince yourself that this is useful chemistry that you want to try. Now, I personally haven't ever done any electrosynthesis, but I would be interested in trying my hand at some at some point. As you might expect, they use the electrosyn. This can do multiple reactions at the same time. I might be interested in doing a video on the electrosyn at some point in the future. If you're working for ICA or you're involved in the Baron Lab and you're interested in having a conversation, I'd encourage you to reach out. They also demonstrated that this chemistry could be scaled up to flow. And they do some other cool chemistry in here, such as in situ formation of the redox active esters. And I'd encourage you to go read the full paper because there's a lot of chemistry packed into one paper. So the takeaway from this is this is a new way to couple redox active esters. The advantage of using silver in this chemistry is it prevented fouling the electrode. Additionally, the silver helped keep the catalyst alive longer, and it also reduced the overpotential needed for this chemistry to happen, which greatly improved their functional group tolerance. It's a good paper, and I was really pleased to see it. So normally we only do five papers, but we have an honorary sixth paper in honor of Bob Grubbs. Bob Grubbs passed away earlier this year. I had the pleasure of hearing him speak at my university on one occasion, and every seat in that room was full, including the entire floor of the room. People were sitting everywhere, and he gave an excellent talk. He will definitely be missed. So they had submitted this paper before he passed away, and as such, he was an author on the paper when it was published. This is a little bit outside of the scope of what I normally cover on this channel. I don't usually talk about polymers, but this is kind of an interesting paper. And in honor of Bob Grubbs, I'm going to talk about it anyway. So effectively, what they do in this paper is they synthesize cyclic polymers, which are normally really challenging to make on a large scale. And the issue is recycling the catalyst can be really inefficient. So what they did is they immobilized their catalyst onto silica and they produced this whole glassware setup that makes it easier for them to continually produce more and more cyclic polymers. One of the things that they found is that the monomer needed to be extremely pure. You can see that they had a trace impurity of various different linear alkenes, and they needed to remove all of these and purify out even purer monomer. And so they did this through hydroboration. All the stuff that remained was heavy and non-volatile. They could just distill out the cyclopentene, and then they were able to do their chemistry with it to make cyclic polymers. And so their setup is as follows. They add in their monomers in solvent from up here. They reduce the pressure so that they can still boil off their monomer and recycle it. In the reaction, they have a cellulose thimble. So the catalyst on silica is stored within this thimble. It's able to be heated or cooled to the appropriate reaction temperature. And after the reaction's done, they're able to drain out the polymer into a collection flask. All of the monomer is then able to be boiled out of this, collected back into the reaction vessel, and more monomer can be added. And they do this for several cycles, and they study the properties of the polymer formed with each cycle. And if this sounds interesting to you, I'd encourage you to go check it out. So there's a lot of honorable mentions for today. I'd encourage you to take a look in the description and click on any of these if they seem interesting. We had a really good month in organic synthesis with lots of good papers that are definitely worth your time and attention to read. Just because these aren't within the top five papers doesn't mean they're not worth your time. All of the papers I've included here are worth your time if you haven't read them yet. So hopefully you've enjoyed this episode, and I hope you have a great day.